And you guys know how the saying goes, when in Rome, avoid Iga Fiantek in the draw, ladies and gentlemen. Iga Fiantek, she surges out to a first set lead over Yulia Putinseva, 6'3". But Iga's not the defending champion here, guys. It was Elena Rabakina who had to withdraw due to health reasons. And listen, we are concerned for Elena Rabakina. We want to send her wishes and much love. Even Iga fans, send Rabakina love. I know you guys necessarily don't want to click on an Iga video and hear someone talking about Rabakina, but she was a champion. She had to withdraw. We wish her a speedy recovery. Now, Iga's fiance, guys, hasn't necessarily done well against Elena Rabakina. She's lost to her seven times if we go back to juniors and count all the overall matches they face each other. But Yulia hasn't had success against Iga. They face each other three times. Yulia has lost all three times. Yulia has not even won a set off of Iga's fiance. And she drops the first set 6-3. How did Iga do it? 74% of her first serves in play. Now, I said this time and time again. When I see Iga Fiante getting at least 70% of her first serves in play, I'm a happy man. She won 72% of those, 67% of the second serve. Yulia struggled on the second serve, losing 86% of her second serves. If we take a look at the unforced errors and the forced errors, and I am so happy for tournaments like Rome, not all tournaments report the forced and the unforced errors. As someone that's very statistical, someone that loves numerology, I like to get the full range of numbers, right? And not all tournaments report that because I can gauge if the error is coming from the server or the returner, who's making the mistakes, the situational leadership, the different points and just seeing how the players are reacting to different balls and different scenarios on the court. So I love the stats where I can dissect the unforced and the forced errors. But I want to take a deep dive into this match, right? Why? Because Yuli Putinseva, if you're not familiar with her, uh, she plays her best tennis on clay, and she's got really good variety. Now, I'm surprised that, and, and look, not all the matches they face each other has been on clay, but I'm surprised Yulia hasn't done well against Iga because Yulia has a good arsenal. Now, they played earlier this year. I want to say, uh, you know, again, I do a lot of these videos just off of my memory and what I know from watching so much tennis, so I could be wrong here, but I think they faced each other. I want to say at the Indian Wells, I could be wrong, but they played earlier this year and, and Iga pretty much dominated that match. And here early on, she, Yulia loses the first set, but she's doing things right in the second set. She's actually up three love as she breaks Iga's fiance. Now, Yulia has good short balls. Now, we saw her just frustrate Sloane Stevens, who came into that matchup against Yulia last time out, nine and two on clay. Sloan's having a very good clay season, and Yulia as well. But Yulia frustrated Sloan Stevens with the short ball. Sloan's a very patient counterpuncher, but Yulia just got her off of that baseline running forward. The reason I bring that up is Iga Fiante uses a, a semi Western grip. Now, Coco, you know, again, it's, you know, depending i used to be very technical with stuff like this but a lot of times you know you want to please your demographics and people for the most part they want me to cover the match and give them the statistics and updates and predictions on what's going on right ego uses a semi-western grip coco you know a lot of the experts consider coco to use a uh what we would term an extreme western grip now, the one downside of using a semi-Western grip, and by the way, what does that mean? Gold dap? Okay, I'm, I'm assuming that's Iga number one, right? That's an abbreviation. Gold dap. Now, I see on the signs Jazda Iga a lot. I have no idea what gold dap means. If anyone from Poland can explain that. And listen, Poland's a big market on the channel, right? We love Iga, and I love to learn some of these different words in, 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 in Polish, Gold dap, what does that mean? Now, one of the downsides of using a semi-Western grip is the ability to, to kind of cover the short balls at the net, right? Because a semi-Western grip, it makes it difficult to transition with your, with your racket and your grip to cover these short balls. So 
combine that with the fact that Iga has put much more focus on her singles career. She has lit- she played a lot of doubles and juniors and coming up. In case you're not familiar, trivia guys, who did Iga Swiatek win a junior double slam with? Was it was it Magda Lynette? Magdalena Freck or Kat McNally trivia, right? So Iga has won a junior double slam, but she didn't play a lot of doubles as a professional. She said she wanted to focus on her singles career. So combine that with her semi-Western grip, she can be vulnerable sometimes at the net. This is why I've been surprised that Yulia hasn't done better playing Iga Swiatek because Yulia has an arsenal. I would say if she wasn't overshadowing her great variety with her just outbursts of anger and frustration and just disrupting matches by arguing with the chair empire, we would talk about more, her variety more and how she's she's probably has the best drop shots on the tour with the exception of maybe someone like an Jabor. What do you guys think? I'm surprised he hasn't done better against Iga Swiatek, but Iga Swiatek is very good. She's a short rally player. She's very strong and powerful. Iga comes across court with her back end better than anyone on tour. And that's just coming across court, just threading the needle down the line, attacking the back foot of her opponent. Iga makes some very difficult shots, and you have to practice these type of shots to be comfortable to use them in a game, right? We saw players like uh, I've talked about in the past, Marketa Von Joseva, who said she doesn't necessarily, who's good with drop shots and short balls and trick shots. Marketa said she doesn't actually practice a lot of those shots. A lot of them are just situational, and she kind of she kind of gauges the right time to do it in the match, while Iga's fiance, look at this. Right. So you you saw how she just put she just changed direction constantly. And then Yulia was expecting another back foot shot. She tripped her up there and Yulia hits wide. So Iga is very strategic. And, and that's one thing I want to talk about with Iga's fiance. She's very strategic with her ball placement. Now, she's not necessarily going for the fastest serve. Can she? Iga averages about one hundred and three to 109 miles per hour on her serves, right? I do feel she can go bigger. She does have the power, but I think Iga focuses more on conserving her stamina and ball placement. She's very strategic with her ball placement because it allows her to set up her rallies. If she goes too strong and too fast, that could affect her second and third shots where she's already looking for her winners. While we take a look at someone like Coco, who's the world's ranked number three, who actually has the possibility to climb the rankings to number two if Sabalenka has an early exit here and Coco goes a little bit deeper to pick up points. Coco, I feel, and I've said this in the past because we've seen Coco, you know, with some of the fastest serves on record at a lot of these master and slam tournaments. I've said previously in the past that I think Coco needs to go bigger on her serve and we've seen this year she's going bigger on her serve but she's making a lot more double faults so that's something that i recommended she use and add to her game because coco hasn't gone big in the past on her serve she has the strength and the power but i've said it coming into this season and she's doing it whereas last season i talked about how coco needed to bring in some of these you know atp players and work on the forehand and just work on her power with the forehand and backhand. She did that and she had her best season ever, right? I talked about coming into this upcoming season that Coco needs to go bigger on the serve and use the strength that she hasn't been using. She is doing that, but she's making a lot more double faults. So what I think Coco needs to do, I think she now needs to slow down on the serve. She needs to stop going as big Get the placement down of where she wants to go with it because she's netting a lot, which tells me there's issues on the lift, there's issues on the ball toss, and there's probably issues on the confidence because Coco's such a big athlete. She draws so many fans at her matches and she knows people are are watching 
And the media uses Coco as a stepping stone. You have a lot of journalists that they say things that are, aren't necessarily true because they know it's going to make a story. Journalists, they're not interested in honest reporting. They're interested in narratives that's going to drive their columns, their pages, their videos so they can make money. And that's the one thing I don't like about a lot of these journalists and these channels is they report stuff that's it's not true. And for someone that actually watches the game, you can see how people are biased and part time casual fans. They run with this narrative and they believe it. It's like the news, you know, perception. Don't watch the news if you want to if you want truth. Right. Because the news a lot of times is not reporting that there's agendas, there's propaganda. So what I think Coco needs to do with the serve, I do think she needs to, she's got to slow it down. She's got to work on placement more. Once you get that placement down, once you get the range down, then improve the speed. I think she's going way, way too big now in the serve because she's bulked up. She's put up, she's put on a lot of power coming into the season. This is a full time. We've seen her kind of look like an adult woman with her figure, right? She's very muscular now, but I noticed he's actually lost a little bit, a bit of that muscle as well. She came into Auckland in the Australian Open looking very jacked up. So maybe that's another reason why she started the season winning her first 10 matches because she had a lot more power, where now she's actually slimmed down. She doesn't have a lot of that power. So maybe she felt a bit uncomfortable being that strong, but she clearly had the strength advantage winning her first 10 matches of the season, you know, taking out several top 20 players, Alina Svitolina. Uh, we saw her take out Emma Navarro, Marta Kostyuk. Um, So she won some very, very uh, impressive matches. Even Dayana Yastrzemska, who's, you know, uh, with her performance, uh, again, found herself right around that top 20 mark. But Iga Sviantek, guys, very dominant. I don't like the numerology that I'm seeing with Iga in this tournament. So will she win Rome? I don't know, guys. And actually, she's actually down now three Love against Yulia Putinseva, who got the break earlier. Yulia's starting to feel a little bit more comfortable, who's a good clay player. Yulia moves well. She's got a short center of gravity. She can cover the net a lot. And she disguises her drop shot from the baseline better than anyone. Watch Yulia play. The key for Iga, she's down three love now in the second set. If she wants to get back into the set, do what she did in the first set. Attack the second serve of Yulia, but she's got to disguise the deep balls a little better. If she gives... And, and she's got to play faster. She can't give Yulia these looks to where Yulia can disguise the drop shot and get Iga Sviantek offline, right? Iga Sviantek, a lot of her attacks and points come inside the baseline, but we've seen her with the adjustments on how to take down Rubakina. She's worked on the range and the deep ball that she has. So we're seeing Iga now start to win a lot more points behind the baseline where Essentially, traditionally, that has not been her game style. She hasn't been comfortable playing that deep because 95% of most players on tour are not a threat to win points behind the baseline. There's several exceptions to that rule, and most of those players are actually inside the top 10. Zabalenka can beat you from the baseline. Rebecca definitely can beat you from the baseline, and Coco can. Of all the players, Coco's got the deepest backhand weapon from behind the baseline. Go watch the short I posted the other day where Coco's defending baseline balls six feet behind the baseline, all defensive stops, and she gets a point, and then the crowd just goes crazy. So, Iga, should we panic? Should we get concerned? I don't necessarily think so because even if Yulia wins the second set, Iga makes really good adjustments. I mean, Thomas is a very good coach. Um, I do think we're back and has the best coach on tour right now. But I do think Thomas won it last year. He's definitely probably the, the second best coach on tour right now. But I think Elena does have the best coach on tour. What do you think, guys? Is Iga in trouble? Stay tuned. Tennis in a minute. She's down three love. Should we be concerned? We'll be right back.